Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Planetarium live stream. We are going to wait just a couple minutes for everyone to gather since we are on an unusual day. Uh, so be sure to tell your friends that we're streaming on this lovely Tuesday evening. Uh, and we're just going to roll with the punches here. We are... Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm uh, currently opening a, a can of tomato paste for a dinner after this stream. So, you know, we're all just... We're all just uh, rolling with the punches, and uh, things are going to go great. By the way, I am Patrick Hess, the Planetarium Manager at Union Station. Very excited to have you joining us uh, tonight. Sorry again for postponing from yesterday. Facebook was having a little bit of an issue, um, but it seems like we are live and all uh, ready to rock and roll here. Oops, and I just closed my <laughs> document. That has our Q&A. Okay, all right, there you go. All right, so uh, welcome, everyone. Um, uh, thank you all again for joining us on this lovely Tuesday evening. Uh, thank you to MRI Global, our supporting sponsor, keeping these live streams going and supporting all the many programs uh, that Union Station has to offer in addition to the Planetarium. Uh, this is a live stream. We are live on this lovely Tuesday evening. So uh, be sure to let us know in the comments uh, where you're watching from. Say hello. I give a shout out. And throughout the stream tonight, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments section as well. Uh, so tonight uh, we are going to be going over a tour of our uh, seasonal skies, looking at what is up in our October skies this evening. And I'm just about done opening this can of tomato paste. All right, we did it. Congratulations, Patrick. <laughs> um, and uh, and uh, we're also going to be going over some news updates of uh, what's happened over the past month in space exploration and astronomy news. Uh, so be sure to stay, stay tuned for that. Again, we're going to start with our star tour and to go over space news afterwards. Already getting some people commenting in the comment section. We've got it uh, looks like a little JP saying, hey, uh, Tammy, one of our longtime watchers, says hello from Iowa. It's been a while, Patrick. Uh, it's been a while since we've heard from you, Tammy. Thanks so much for tuning in tonight. Hope you enjoy tonight's stream. And we got Rachel saying greetings from Leavenworth. Thank you all so much for watching tonight and for commenting. Um, and uh, welcome again. Uh, by the way, this is our 75th live stream, which is a little bit crazy that we've been doing these uh, this long. If this is your first time tuning in, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if this is uh, your 75th time tuning in, that'd be amazing. Uh, I kind of doubt anybody has saw, seen every single one of them, except for me and uh, my feathered assistant, Phoebe, maybe. Um, but uh, now thank you all for watching. If you are a first time watcher, uh, don't worry, because we post all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium, uh, so you can find all of our past live streams. Uh, we've been doing them monthly since May of this year, but prior to that, we did them weekly. Uh, and we covered a lot of uh, interesting topics uh, over the past year on our live streams. Uh, and um, uh, just uh, a week or so ago, I think we posted on Facebook my top 10 live streams. There were some uh, good ones on that list. Um, but uh, just to kind of name a few, uh, we I did a whole live stream about Voyager, uh, the Voyager space probe and the golden record, the message we sent to the stars uh, from humanity that was a pretty fun live stream that was on may 13th of last year 2020 um i did a thanksgiving live stream which we will definitely reference next month uh last thanksgiving uh where i talked about all the reasons we can be thankful for space exploration and for nasa i did i've done star tours uh, all around the world not just the northern hemisphere but i did a whole live stream uh star tour of the southern hemisphere on july 27th last year 2020 um, I did a virtual reality live stream where I did I rode along in the uh, passenger seat of the Apollo 11 mission and even tried to land uh, the moon rover on the moon, uh, which I did semi-successfully. Uh, that was uh, on uh, March 8th of this year. That was a fun stream. Uh, all sorts of other uh, interesting topics. I made a Lego International Space Station, talked about Harry Potter astronomy. We made a comment in my living room. Um, so be sure to check those out again, youtube.com slash caseyplanetarium. And while you're over there, be sure to like and subscribe. Um, and uh, got a couple other people commenting. Awesome. Thank you so much for saying hi, everybody. We've got Brenda saying, hey, from KC. Thanks for watching, Brenda. Uh, and, uh, oh, it looks like uh, little JP's birthday uh, was a few days ago. Uh, well, happy birthday. I uh, hope it was a great day, and uh, thanks for celebrating tonight by watching our stream. Nancy says, hi, thanks for sharing uh, the uh, YouTube link, I assume. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope you check out some of those past streams. Hope you enjoy them. 
Uh, and if you ever have any questions about those past three past streams, you can all, always tune in to one of our live streams and ask questions about that. Uh, or you can just post in the comment section and I'll answer them from there as well. And Kelly says, uh, hello from uh, Cheney, Kansas, located near Lake Afton Observatory. Wow, awesome. I've never been there, Kelly, but um, I'm guessing those are some pretty amazing night skies out there. So I hope you get some good views of the stars. Um, a couple of little uh, housekeeping bits. Uh, the planetarium is back open. If you've been following along this summer, uh, the planetarium has gone through uh, some renovations. Uh, we uh, did close down our regular projectors at the beginning of the summer uh, and have been showing laser shows all summer long. And then in September last month, we closed down to install brand new projectors. And now we are back open. Uh, so if you come to the planetarium, you'll get all of our fan favorite shows. Um, in fact, here is a schedule of all the shows going on. Um, we've got Big Bird's Adventure and Magic Treehouse, great shows for the family. And then, of course, our most popular show, Sky Station Live, our seasonal star tour. Uh, as well as some documentary features. Uh, we've got a show about Mars uh, and a documentary about the Apollo program, Capcom Go, and then, of course, a show about dinosaurs, because who doesn't like dinosaurs? Um, our new projectors that we've installed are really amazing. If you've been to the planetarium before, I'd encourage you to come back. These new projectors um, take uh, our uh, shows to a whole new level. Uh, they have a high dynamic range, uh, and they're three times as bright, um, and... Uh, our entire catalog just has new life and some really breathtaking new visualizations we can see during our star tours as well. Uh, so please come back and visit us uh, and uh, check out our brand new tech. We're very excited to be back open. Uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can hear Phoebe playing in the background. She's having a good time over there. Uh, maybe she'll have a cameo a little bit later in the stream if you stick around. For now, though, we are going to jump into our seasonal star tour. Remember, this is a live stream, so if you have any questions or comments throughout tonight's stream about the Star Tour, about the news bits that we uh, uh, are going to cover later, then feel free to put those in there. And we've got Emily saying, thanks for opening the can for me. <laughs> no problem, Emily. <laughs> oh, and Andrew is tuning in from the River Market. Well, hello, Andrew. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you uh, taking one second of time out of your day uh, to tune into this stream. All right, everyone. So let's jump into our star tour. We've got uh, our Kansas City Horizon uh, over here with the planetarium just peeking out above uh, the uh, trees over there uh, as a sidebar. There are so many amazing pictures taken of Union Station, uh, but they always seem to crop out the planetarium. So if you're a photographer and you're taking a picture of our beautiful building there, uh, just for me, I have a personal request of just put a little corner of the planetarium in there because I think it's a cool part of the skyline as well. Now, of course, in our current daytime sky at 6 o'clock, the sun has not set, although it's pretty close to setting. We are approaching winter. In fact, we are officially in fall. Oh, that was one exciting thing that happened over the past month. And now the nights are longer than the days. Uh, so be sure to be taking your vitamin D in the morning, everybody. Uh, but when the sun is out, even when it's twilight, uh, the, it is blocking the view of the stars. Of course, we still have the light, lovely blue sky above us. Uh, and... Uh, the Liberty Memorial is right behind me here, but it kind of blocks the view, so I'm going to adjust our uh, horizon here. Uh, this is uh, Stellarium, by the way. It's a free piece of software you can download for your Windows or Mac PC, uh, and it's basically a virtual planetarium. Uh, so we're going to uh, put just sort of a foresty horizon on there. You can imagine these are sunflowers. Uh, I'm a Kansas boy. And... Uh, all right, there we go. Now we can see the sun above the horizon there. Uh, Leonard is saying hello from Everett, Washington. Wow, Leonard, thanks so much for tuning in tonight. I hope you enjoy the stream, and I hope you enjoy some views of our Kansas City skies as well. So we're going to fast forward time a little bit and get that sun to start setting. And as the sun sets, we are going to notice a couple things uh, in our sky, even before the sun finishes setting. So as it's dipping below the horizon, we're going to reach uh, twilight. And then right behind the sun, we can already see a really bright point of light shining over in the southwest sky. Um, and that's actually not the only bright point of light. Over in the southeast, there's another bright point of light. In fact, if I fast forward just a smidge more, there will be a third bright point of light. There it is popping it right up there. So these bright points of light are shining so brightly, we can see them in the daytime sky here before the sun has finished setting. Uh, now... If you look closely at these points of light, another thing you would notice when you compare them to the stars when the night sky comes out is that these three points of light are not twinkling. Unlike the stars in the sky, which we can see starting to pop up here, 
these dots don't twinkle. These dots are all planets. So we've got a few planets visible tonight. We've got Venus setting in the southwest and then rising in the southeast. We've got Saturn and Jupiter. So again, we can tell that they're planets because they're not twinkling. Now you can also tell that they're planets because they won't be in the same place every night. Planets appear to wander around our night sky because they orbit the sun at their own pace. That's how they got their name. The word planet means wanderer in ancient Greek, so they'll wander around the night sky. Um, and you'll also notice, since we have three planets visible right now, they all kind of line up with one another. I want to pop something up here that I don't usually bring up. But if we draw a line through these planets, oh, there's actually a name for that line, uh, and that is the ecliptic. So if I turn the ecliptic on here, uh, there we go. So the ecliptic is sort of a line that stretches around the world, kind of like a hula hoop going around the planet, around our night sky. And this line represents the path that our sun takes through the sky. So we can see the sun set right along the ecliptic. And all the planets appear close to that ecliptic line as well. Uh, this also represents the plane of our solar system. So all the planets orbit around the sun in sort of a flat disk, like a big frisbee or a big pancake. And so from here on Earth, if we're looking out and we're looking at where the planets are, their positions, they'll all appear on that plane, on that disk, right? And so that's what we that, that's what the ecliptic is. And that's why all the planets always sort of line up. Now, they're not exactly on the ecliptic since all the planets, uh, their, their own orbital planes are a little bit offset, uh, but you can always find the... Uh, uh, the planets on the ecliptic uh, plane there. So let's fast forward a little bit more for that sun to finish setting. And as uh, the sun sets, about an hour after sunset, we'll spend our star tour, which is around 8 p.m. That's when uh, our uh, that's when twilight mostly leaves. About an, uh, for a full hour after the sun is officially dipped below the horizon, there's still plenty of extra uh, sunlight uh, blocking our view. Let's turn the ecliptic off. So we always wait about an hour after the sunset. And now you can really see all those twinkling stars uh, with those three planets not twinkling. Now the reason stars twinkle is because they're so far away from Earth that by the time a distant star's light reaches our planet, only a tiny amount of it is able to pass through the Earth's dense atmosphere. And our atmosphere causes that little speck of light to become distorted, making it appear to wobble and twinkle. That's why stars twinkle. But planets are a lot closer than distant stars. Uh, and I can actually show you that. So, for example, um, we're kind of going a little out of order today, actually, not my, my typical order, which is kind of fun. It's keeping things fresh. Um, so let's talk about the stars here. There's a fun star over in the southwest that um, I like talking about. It's right here. It's called Antares. Um, this is one of the reddest stars in the night sky, uh, by the way. Uh, and the color of a star tells us its surface temperature as well as its age. Antares is a relatively cool and old star. Now, if I zoom in on this dot... Um, you'll see it's really, really twinkling there, and you'll see it's bright red. By the way, Antares means rival of Mar Mars, and ancient people sometimes mistook this star for Mars because it was so red. So if we zoom in on these stars, uh, here, now, Stellarium is kind of simulating uh, them as a, a, a bright dot, but if we zoom in on the stars near, it, near them, you'll see that they're just little tiny specks, right? Um, but if I zoom in on a planet like Venus, you'll see that if we zoom in far enough, it'll start to be resolved as a full disk. And that's why planets don't twinkle. It's because a full disk of their light is actually reflect, reflecting towards us. Uh, whereas a star, if you look at a star through a telescope, it'd still look like a tiny speck. Um, so while we're looking at Venus, we can talk a little bit about our sister planet. Venus is closer to the sun than the Earth is, which means Venus always appears in phases, kind of like the moon. Right now, the Venus is in a gibbous phase. It's more than half full. Um, but uh, over the course of the next month or so, it's going to become crescent and it'll get uh, a little bit dimmer or uh, less less full, I guess you could say. Um, now, Venus is called our sister planet because it's about the same size as Earth uh, and it has a solid rocky surface like Earth and an atmosphere like Earth. Uh, so it has a lot of similarities to Earth. A couple other people are chiming in the comments. We've got Kat who says, love this. Awesome, Kat. I'm glad you're enjoying this stream. Uh, Kelly also says, me too. I'm glad you guys are having fun tonight. I'm having fun as well, especially when you guys are commenting, so I know that you're all watching. We've got Eric, one of our longtime watchers, saying howdy from Lenexa. How's it going, Eric? Hope you're having a good night. And we've got Rachel saying, if most of the distortion of the light happens from Earth's atmosphere, wouldn't both stars and planets twinkle since both sources of light have come through the atmosphere? That's a great question, Rachel. Um, so I, I may have explained that uh, after you asked that question, but just to reiterate, um, so the stars are so distant that only a tiny speck of light a little pinpoint actually is what goes through our atmosphere. And um, that's a small enough amount of light that our atmosphere causes it to become distorted. Whereas those planets, a lot more of their light, more than just a single point, 
passes through our atmosphere. And so they're not as disrupted. Now on a really, really sort of uh, a bad night where say there's a lot of um, poor air quality or pollution, then even the planets might twinkle a little bit, but not nearly as much as the stars. That's a great question, Rachel. Thanks for asking. Don't forget, this is a live stream, everyone. So if you have any questions or just want to say hi and let us know where you're watching from, put those in the comment section, please. Um, we've got uh, Linda, for example, saying hi from Leewood, Kansas. Thank you so much, Linda, for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying tonight's stream and tonight's star tour. So while we're facing south, we might as well continue looking at some things. Uh, that co The constellation that uh, Antares is a part of is called Scorpius, the scorpion. Um, you can find it by looking for Antares there uh, with four stars kind of fanning out next to it. Uh, these are the claws of the scorpion here. And then the body of the scorpion kind of curves backwards with a stinger at the end. Now it looks like a big hook and actually Polynesian cultures saw that hook as representing the hook of the demigod Maui. Um, and um, if you've seen the movie Moana, you might recognize that star pattern. There we go. Um, so again, that star pattern it popped up in the movie Moana. Uh, let's, let's put the name there and the art. All right, so Scorpius in Greek mythology was a monster that the hunter Orion battled. Now, Orion is a name that might ring a bell in the night sky. Orion's a very famous constellation. Uh, it is unfortunately a winter constellation. And although it's one, it's probably my favorite constellation, um, it is not quite up yet. If you stay up really late tonight after midnight, you'd see it, but uh, for the early night sky, which is where I like to spend my star tours because I've got an early bedtime. Um, that's not true at all. I stay up really late. But my viewers <laughs> usually have early bedtimes. Uh, so uh, we're, we're not going to talk about Orion tonight. But don't forget, we are streaming on the first Monday of the month. Uh, and we'll be back, of course, in the wintertime. And we'll definitely be talking about Orion then. Uh, so we're going to leave that story for now. Um, but in the meantime, we've got a bunch of people chiming in. Oh, Rachel says, thanks, Patrick. That's a great explanation about the uh, twinkling. Oh, I'm glad that makes sense, Rachel. Appreciate you. Aaron says, hello, everyone. Uh, well, hello, Aaron. Thanks for saying hi to everybody else. So we don't get a lot of people who uh, to say hi to the rest of our viewers. And that's kind of fun. We're getting a little, little bit of a community interaction. Uh, so yeah, well, thanks for saying hi uh, to each other. Uh, and uh, we've got another person from Olathe, Kansas tuning in. And um, I am going to apologize because this name uh, appears to be uh in russian uh and um i'm gonna attempt to uh nope never mind uh so um uh, if you'd like to let us know uh how to pronounce your name i would love to give it a shot but uh thank you so much for watching from olathe kansas uh, we've also got Megan sa who says, uh, I love space. I am mostly a nerd. Well, Megan, um, I'm glad you love space and I'm glad you uh, are admitting that you are mostly a nerd. I will be the first to fully admit that I am 100% a nerd. Um, so, uh, but it's okay to be mostly a nerd because there are a lot of other great things to be. Um, uh, Eric says, Orion is clear at four o'clock in the morning. Well, there you go. So everybody just stay up till 4 a.m. and you'll be able to see Orion nice and clear tonight. All right, so let's move on to... Uh, Let's uh, let's go towards the southeast, how about? Uh, and we've got a great asterism, which is an unofficial star pattern, uh, unlike a constellation, which are official star patterns. This asterism is called the teapot. It's made of these bright stars that are part of Sagittarius. Uh, so here's the teapot's handle. Here's the lid and the spout. Um, so if I pop that up, uh, you can see the rest of the constellation Sagittarius. And I'm... I don't think there are... Any asterisms I can pop up here. Um, but uh, so Sagittarius is a centaur uh, in mythology. Uh, but that teapot there is an easy uh, pattern to spot. Just uh, It's probably the second most famous asterism next to the Dippers, uh, the Big and Little Dipper, which we'll touch on in a moment. Um, and uh, that teapot asterism, uh, you can use to find Sagittarius, of course, but you can also use it to find the Milky Way galaxy, um, which we can see stretching up from the southern sky right now. And I think I can boost the brightness of the Milky Way, potentially, uh, using some sort of setting on my software here that I can't find. Well, uh, <laughs> 
Uh, I guess I, I guess I can't boost the bright. I'm sure there's a way I can boost the brightness of the Milky Way. Um, all I can say though is, if you come to the planetarium and see our star tour, we see the Milky Way very clearly with our amazing new projectors. But you can see a faint, sort of fuzzy patch of light, a band of light stretching up from the southern sky that the teapot is pointing towards here, uh, and that is the faint outline of the Milky Way galaxy. Oh gosh, I'm sure there's a way. Oh yeah, here we go. Aha! Let's boost the brightness of the Milky Way there. Ah, now we can see it much better. Uh, so this is the outline of our galaxy. Uh, there are 500 billion stars in the Milky Way, and the Milky Way stretches all around us. But you'll notice over here in the other direction, towards the north right now, it's a bit dimmer than it is in the south right now. So our solar system is located about two-thirds of the way from the center to the edge of our galaxy, um, which means in one direction it's much brighter than the others, because here in the summer and fall we can see the galactic core, where it's densest and brightest. So if you follow the pointy spout of the teapot, it points right at the center of our galaxy. Now I'd encourage you to check out last, last month's live stream because I talked about the black hole at the center of our galaxy during that stream. Um, but for tonight, we are going to talk a little bit more about galaxies uh, in uh, just a bit. But we're going to continue our night sky star tour. We've got Sharon uh, saying greetings from Montana. Wow, Sharon, thanks for tuning in all the way up there. I hope you're enjoying tonight's stream. Uh, I bet you've got some good... Uh, views of the sky up where you're at. Um, all right, let's dim the Milky Way here. So we're going to continue on over to, well, let's see, what other constellation do we want to check out? Uh, well, so we can uh, touch on the planets here. I'm going to zoom in on uh, Saturn first. Oh, they're in the constellation Capricorn, apparently. Um, Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, so Saturn here, zooming in. Ooh, it's flying by really quickly. <laughs> that is not Saturn moving, of course. It's the Earth's rotation. So there we can see Saturn uh, shining uh, over in our evening sky tonight. Saturn's a really cool planet. Uh, in fact, if you have a pair of binoculars at home, I'd encourage you to point them at Saturn uh, because Saturn is actually a planet you can resolve through binoculars, and you can even see the rings of Saturn through those binoculars. Uh, now, uh, we talk about Saturn, and we actually fly to Saturn during our live star tour at the Planetarium, so be sure to check that out if you want to learn more about Saturn, or you can watch uh, our Saturn live stream. Uh, that was from July 6th, 2020, uh, where I did a hour-long deep dive into the jewel of our solar system, Saturn. Again, uh, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium has all of our past live streams. Uh, we'll check out um, Jupiter real quickly as well. Jupiter is a fun one. Through a pair of binoculars, you can see it's Galilean moons, the four moons that Galileo saw through his telescope. Right now, they are lined up next to Jupiter. Um, they are Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io. Io appears maybe to be hiding behind Jupiter at this moment. When Galileo saw Jupiter through his telescope, he plotted the, uh, the positions of these points next to Jupiter over the course of weeks and months. And as he plotted their positions and saw they were moving back and forth, uh, that is when he started to formulate his theory that, uh, unlike what most people believed at the time, uh, the Earth actually went around the Sun and not the other way around. Um, so uh, Jupiter, by the way, we of course did an entire deep dive live stream on, and that was uh, on June 29th of last year. Again, youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. Like and subscribe. Um, <laughs> So we're not going to spend too much time talking about the planets because I want to go over towards our north uh, east and uh, touch on... Actually, first of all, I'm going to go over to the north and just point out uh, the dippers here. Uh, there's the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper above it. They're part of the constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the Big and Little Bear. Uh, they're some of the most famous patterns. Uh, many people know these famous asterisms, the dippers. And then the official constellations Ursa Major and Ursa Minor the big and little bear. They use these stars. Uh, that star at the end of the little bear's tail is, of course, the north star, Polaris, that stays pointing north all night long as the other stars rotate around it. Uh, but we're going to move right along because we're running out of time for our star tour, and I want to talk about uh, a couple constellations over in the northeast right now that are playing out a famous story from Greek mythology. Uh, this bright W-shaped constellation is called Cassiopeia, and then above Cassiopeia, we have an upside-down house-shaped constellation called Cepheus. Now, Cepheus and Cassiopeia were the king and queen of an ancient African nation. The queen Cassiopeia was very beautiful, but as you can see in this picture, she was very vain. She liked to uh, look at herself in the mirror and brag about her beauty. Now, one day Cassiopeia boasted that she was more beautiful than the daughters of Poseidon, the god of the sea. Now, when Poseidon heard about this, he was not very happy, as you can imagine. A mere mortal claiming 
He was more beautiful than Poseidon's immortal daughters. He could not let that stand. So he punished uh, Cepheus and Cassiopeia by cursing their land with years and years of flooding, which washed away many of their crops and sent their kingdom into a terrible famine. Cepheus and Cassiopeia tried desperately to appease the god Poseidon and ease his wrath. They eventually did what any two good parents would have done in the situation, and they decided to sacrifice their own daughter to the sea god. Their daughter looks sort of like a banana peel in our fall skies. Her name is Andromeda. And they tied Andromeda to some rocks by the ocean so she could be eaten by Cetus, a giant sea monster and one of Poseidon's other children. Now, luckily for Andromeda, the story has a happy ending. It just so happens that Perseus was passing by that day on his winged horse Pegasus. Perseus was a famous Greek hero. And Perseus decided to save the day. He used the head of Medusa, another monster he'd recently defeated. There we can see her head. Uh, to turn the sea monster Cetus to stone, and he rescued the princess. And of course, as most of these stories go, Perseus and Andromeda fell in love, got married, and lived happily ever after. Now, the reason I wanted to bring up this set of constellations and Andromeda is because near Andromeda's waist is a deep space object called the Andromeda Galaxy. Now, this deep space object is actually visible to the naked eye on a clear night. If you're far enough away from the city lights, away from that light pollution, um, you can see Andromeda as a faint patch of light. Andromeda is a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. It's kind of like our big sister. She's twice as big as the Milky Way, containing over one trillion stars. And uh, she's also very close to us, the closest spiral galaxy to us. In fact, if she were brighter, she would occupy a space six times as wide as the moon in the night sky. Now, the coolest thing about Andromeda is that unlike uh, other galaxies in our universe, which are flying away from each other, Andromeda is traveling towards the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and it's heading for us at about 68 miles per second, and in 4 billion years, our two galaxies will collide. Now check this out, I've got a piece of simulation software called Universe Sandbox that we've used before to do things like blow up the Earth or make the sun go supernova. But I've not done this simulation before, so this should be fun. Um, we are going to... Uh, we are going to look at what will happen in 4 billion years when... Oh, uh, when the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way Galaxy collide. So our two galaxies are on a collision course with each other. Uh, and uh, let's press play here. Ooh. Oh, okay, we're wobbling. We're wobbling. Oh, no. Hang on. Let's, uh, let's reload this. <laughs> All right. So let's press play here, and let's see what happens in about 4 billion years. So as our galaxies approach, uh, their gravity will start influencing each other. Uh, and they'll start pulling the stars inside of them uh, towards each other and disrupting the structures of our galaxies. So both of our galaxies are spirals, but as you'll see, as they approach, um, their structures will, so will start to dis dissipate. Now these blue patches here are nebulas, uh, patches of gas and dust where new stars are being born. And so our galaxies are relatively young, uh, so they're dominated by these nebulas, these blue patches. But over time, as our galaxies merge and age, you'll see our galaxies uh, will start to turn yellow. Uh, this is as our nebulas are starting to burn out and all the star all the star formation material starts to form new stars. Uh, and eventually our two galaxies will combine into a new type of galaxy called an elliptical galaxy, which will be more yellow in color and it won't be as nicely structured as uh, it was originally. So you can see our, the spiral patterns are totally gone as our two galaxies have collided and eventually uh, our galaxies will merge to form sort of a brand new super galaxy. Now, uh, us humans don't have to worry about this. Most stars are so far away from one another that there is very little chance of any two stars colliding or even interacting with each other's solar systems when this happens. Uh, plus, this won't happen for another four billion years, and I don't know about y'all, but I've got other places to be in four billion years. Um, but this should be a, quite a spectacular sight. Um, in fact, NASA has an article uh, they published a few, oh, geez, almost about a decade ago, about this collision that has some pretty cool visualizations. They have their own simulation, uh, like the one we just saw. Um, but, uh, oh, sorry, my computer is uh, about to catch on fire because it's, uh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, turn that simulation off. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this article has some cool visualizations showing what it might look like to humans or other life forms uh, as they looked up into the sky as our galaxies were approaching. So here you can see its current size and distance which is a lot closer than distant galaxies, but still pretty far away. But over the course of time, it doesn't give any specifics here, but, uh, oh, here we go. So 
Um, so in two billion years, we can see the disk approaching. Let me zoom out a little bit here. Um, so that's two billion years from now. Uh, Andromeda will be much closer and much brighter. In three and a half billion years or so, Andromeda will fill almost our full field of view. Uh, and then we have in 3.8 billion years, the sky is ablaze with new star formation. So as our two galaxies combine, as those nebulas, those materials merge, uh, new stars start to be uh, become uh, being born. And then over the course of billions more years, five, seven billion years, billion years from now, you'll see uh, the blue color of the Milky Way and Andromeda are gone as all the stars have been born and you'll just see a bright yellow glow in the sky uh, after all that star formation happened. Uh, so again, these yellow elliptical galaxies are older galaxies and that is what will happen to the Milky Way and Andromeda when they merge. Um, so uh, pretty cool stuff. And when you look up at the Andromeda constellation, uh, you can now uh, just imagine what it might look like in billions of years when our two galaxies start to merge. All right, so that is our star tour. Stick around, everyone, though, because we are going to be jumping into our uh, news update. We're going to see what's happened over the past month in astronomy news. Uh, so let's check over to the comments section. Don't forget, we are live. Um, I am the planetarium manager, Patrick Hess, to anybody who's tuned in recently. Uh, and uh, we are answering your questions live on the air about uh, space and astronomy. Um, we've got uh, Megan saying, uh, <laughs> uh, oh, this is our, our mostly nerdy person, Megan, saying, <laughs> I'm, I am just using my mom's laptop. Well, Megan, I'm glad you're, you're making it work watching our stream. And then Alin also commenting, saying, amazing. I'm glad you're enjoying uh, this uh, stream. Um, oh, and Megan is also watching uh, from Missouri. Thank you all so much again. If you are watching, let us know where you're watching from and if you have any questions or comments throughout the stream. Um, but we are going to dive right in and we're going to start, uh, we're going to start with astronomy news since we just talked about um, uh, galaxies. Let's talk a little bit about a news update that popped up recently. Here's a really cool paper that was published. Um, I'm not going to make you read this and go cross-eyed, but I just wanted to Always use primary sources, of course. Uh, but this uh, uh, article published recently by some astrophysicists, uh, basically these astrophysicists were measuring the shapes and sizes of a couple of gas clouds uh, in our galaxy, and they discovered really big gaps between them. Uh, so there are some uh, imagery of these gas clouds. They're called the Taurus and Perseus gas cloud. Again, these are star forming regions. Um, and so they discovered a big gap between these two gas clouds. Uh, and this has led the researchers who uh, in this paper uh, describe how they were are they've been led to believe that these clouds are uh, what's left of a series of stellar explosions or one massive stellar explosion like a supernova. So here's some 3D imagery of that gas cloud. Uh, there's also um, a, a YouTube video published by the Center of Astrophysics. Uh, we'll pause here to make sure we don't get copyright striked, but this is just cool 3D visualization of uh, what that explosion might have done to form that gas cloud. Um, so you can see the gas clouds uh, being imaged there. Uh, do, let's uh, check this out. So, um, so this cavity in space is about 500 light years across, and it sits between the constellations Perseus and Taurus, which are both hosts to these giant gas clouds called molecular clouds. Uh, so researchers are studying this empty space uh, and uh, they believe that either a single massive supernova blasted all this gassy material outwards or several supernova created the two clouds with tons of space between them. Um, so uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, you know, astronomers aren't only studying uh, things in space, but they're studying the absence of things, voids in space. And sometimes voids are the most interesting. That's kind of where the study of dark matter comes from. Uh, places uh, or uh, things in space that are being influenced by things that we cannot see. So these voids are sometimes just as interesting to scientists as the things around them. Speaking of supernovas, here's kind of an interesting story that's popped up uh, recently. Uh, just the other, uh, well, a couple weeks ago, astronomers uh, spotted uh, a supernova three times in a row. And it was the same supernova. Here's a, a graphic showing it. Um, and basically, they saw three points of light, uh, and actually these, these images were taken in 2016, but the scientists studying them today made this discovery recently. Um, and these three dots were all the same supernova. You know, now, you might be wondering, uh, how can astronomers see the same thing three times? Well, this is all thanks to gravitational lensing. So you'll see sort of a curved shape around here, and this is not actually 
These aren't curved galaxies. What we're seeing here is the effects of the gravity of these yellow galaxies in the center bending the light of stars and galaxies around them. So these three dots circled here are actually three images, three ghostly sort of uh, after images of a supernova that happened uh, a long time ago and that appear in three different places because the light from this supernova is becoming bent and distorted. Um, and uh, now the coolest thing about this is that, um, let's see if we can go back, uh, is that we'll actually see a, this a, a fourth time. So scientists have done the math and they've discovered that in 16 years, in the year 2037, we'll be able to see this same supernova for a third time, or supernova deja vu. And that's again, all thanks to gravitational lensing. So that light from that supernova has taken so long to get to us but it's uh, some light is still going to be sort of looping around uh, that uh, massive galaxy, uh, and eventually it will reach us again. So mark your calendars, everybody. Uh, in 2037, we'll see that supernova again. Uh, oh, yeah, we've got, uh, looks like uh, commenting from uh, Megan's profile is actually Silas watching, who says there are nine. Well, thank you, Silas, so much for tuning in. Um, I gotcha. Silas is using uh, their mom's laptop. Okay, so shout out to Silas for watching tonight. Uh, thank you so much for uh, watching. And uh, Silas, I want you to think of a good astronomy question because I would love to answer it for you. All right, let us continue. Let's uh, bring things a little down to Earth and check out what's happened uh, in Earth and around Earth's orbit over the past month. Uh, so here is a bit of international news. Uh, China and the Chinese Space Agency landed uh, a historic flight after uh, three months in space. So um, China, we've been following along this story actually over the past two years now, a uh, year and a half. Um, China has been building their own space station up in space. Uh, it's called uh, Tiangong, and it'll be about as 20% as big as the International Space Station. Uh, and this uh, crew that just returned after three months in space was the first crew to visit the space station. Um, and this crew was up in space three times longer than any previous uh, crewed uh, mission. There's a picture of them uh, returning to space. Um, they performed two spacewalks uh, designed to help uh, construct the 54-foot-long uh, space station, uh, and they also uh, do, 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 uh, did some science experiments as well. Um, now, uh, China plans to, plans to launch two more modules into orbit, which will link up with uh, the one module that's there now to eventually finish building the space station. It should be completed uh, in a uh, the next year, it looks like. Uh, so congratulations to their uh, space agency. And uh, it's always good to see more people in space. Uh, speaking of people in space, another historic mission happened uh, recently, and that was the Inspiration4 mission. Uh, so this was the SpaceX mission taking a, uh, an all-civilian crew to, the, uh, to space for the first time. Uh, they were aboard the Crew Dragon capsule. Uh, and this is uh, their website, uh, just following along uh, with some press releases about their returns. This happened uh, a couple weeks ago, um, but uh, there uh, were was some pretty cool uh, images and video from that mission. In fact, let's pop uh, this uh, video up here. Let's see. All right. Okay, so here is uh, a video of them opening the cupola, uh, which was a really cool uh, viewing uh, a bubble that they added to the dragon capsule. Um, so we'll let this play out here. Uh, so, so this mission was a uh, pretty pretty important. Again, it was the first all civilian mission into space. Um, uh, so uh, there was a a, a lot of different people. Uh, there was a healthcare worker who went up there, and a couple entrepreneurs, and um, and you know, obviously, it's still very expensive to go to space right now, but uh, it is exciting that uh, more people, now civilians, are getting to go to space. So uh, over time, it'll become cheaper and cheaper and more accessible for uh, people going to space. Let's fast forward a little bit. Oh, there we go. So now they're looking up uh, into the uh, cupola. This is just a giant window in space where they could look down at the Earth. Uh, so they were up in space for about four days, uh, and everything went pretty well. Uh, I did hear that they had some issues with their space toilet, which uh, nobody wants to happen when you're in space, but I think they're okay. Uh, I think they... Uh, they dealt with it just fine. I don't think it was quite as bad as the, I think it was the Apollo 8 mission where they had some serious issues with their uh, toilets. Um, 
So uh, another cool thing about this mission is that uh, this broke a space record uh, because the Shenzhou 12 mission that I just talked about, the Chinese mission, was up at the same time along with the International Space Station. Uh, and so for uh, a couple days, there were 14 humans in space at the same time, which is uh, uh, breaking all sorts of records. Uh, so congratulations to that crew going to space. Uh, Leonard uh, commented saying, anything we can see in, in Seattle? at about 48 degrees latitude that you can't see in KC at about 39 degrees latitude, about uh, 620 miles difference in latitude. Leonard, that's an awesome question. So Leonard's asking if you travel north up to, say, Seattle, can you see anything uh, that, uh, up there that you couldn't see down in Kansas City? Uh, and uh, the unfortunate answer is no, it's quite the opposite, actually. So um, the farther north you go, uh, sort of the uh, less of the night sky you can see. Um, so uh, I actually have a visual aid. Now let me go grab it and I'll be right back. And we're back. So uh, here, Leonard, is uh, what we call an armillary sphere, uh, which is a little bit dusty. Whew, so dusty that's showing up uh, in the stream a little bit too well. A little embarrassing, that's okay. Um, but this is a 3D star map. Now, um, this lays out the star, the, the celestial sphere, the star map around the Earth, as it appears to us here on Earth. Uh, and I can spin the Earth around. So the Earth is is uh, rotating around its axis. There, you can, you can, you can see it. Oh. See it rotating in there, right? Uh, so if you're standing on the Earth, uh, say at a point on the equator, on that red line, then as the Earth spins around, or we can imagine the stars spinning around the Earth, you could see every single star and object in the night sky uh, if you stayed up late enough. Because standing there um, the, on the horizon, you can see all the way to the south celestial pole and the north celestial pole. So the equator is the best place to go stargazing because you can see pretty much everything in the night sky as the Earth spins around. But as you travel, say, north to a place like Kansas City, which is about 40 degrees latitude, your view is going to be a little obstructed. There's going to be a section of the southern celestial sphere that is not visible to you because you'd have to sort of look through the Earth to see it. And so hopefully you can kind of imagine uh, that from here. So if you're standing there on the north uh, on a northern latitude, and then there would be a portion of that celestial sphere, that night sky, you couldn't see. And the farther north you travel, the bigger that portion is. And if you take it to the extreme and go all the way to the North Pole, well, then you can imagine you can only see half of the night sky. Anything below the celestial equator is not visible at all. Um, so unfortunately, if you want to see more of the night sky, you'll want to travel south. Um, now, I will say that depending on where you are, if you're far away from light pollution, uh, Leonard, you may have a better view of us regardless. Um, uh, if you do uh, a search on your favorite browser for uh, a light pollution map, um, then you'd be able to see uh, how good your night sky viewing is. And here in Kansas City, uh, there's a lot of light pollution. You can travel to the west, to western Kansas, to see some pretty good skies. Uh, but up in Seattle, um, the night skies are going to be uh, quite a bit better. Now, close to the city, of course, there are going to be issues, but you have to travel a lot less distance. Um, to see a really beautiful night sky. If you go here to the northeast, over to this uh, uh, national forest area, uh, then you'd be able to see a much nicer sky than we could see down here. So in a way, Leonard, uh, yes, there are things that you'd be able to see up there that we couldn't see down here, uh, but not because of your latitude, but because of the quality of the sky. So hopefully that answers your question, Leonard. Um, we've also got a Silas. Uh, say, oh, uh, Silas is asking a question, how was the Milky Way made? Silas, that's an awesome question. Thanks so much for asking that question. How was the Milky Way made? Well, the Milky Way uh, is a big collection of, of millions and billions of stars, right? And those stars uh, have uh, all been floating around for a while. And uh, those stars started out in star clusters. Um, so the stars, uh, well, let me, let me backtrack. So when stars are born, they're born from nebulas, clouds of gas, right? But those clouds of gas make a lot of stars. So when that cloud of gas makes stars, it makes a bunch of stars that are all kind of clumped together, right? From that, from that, uh, those ingredients. And those stars kind of stay clumped together. We call those star clusters. Uh, and so those stars kind of stay together. And then maybe another nebula over here made its own little clump of stars. But those two clumps of stars are sitting here and gravity starts pulling them together. And when, those, when gravity pulls the clumps together, it forms an even bigger clump. And then that bigger clump has more gravity, so it might grab more clumps, and it might bring them closer and closer together. And so what will happen is eventually enough of those clumps will kind of smush together, uh, Silas, where, where it'll form a galaxy. 
Um, and as those clumps uh, start smushing together and as more and more gas and material start making new stars, it'll start spinning around. Um, and that spinning force will kind of flatten it out a little bit. Um, and that's why the Milky Way looks like sort of a big flat spirally disk. Um, but then eventually when galaxies get older, when they crash into each other, like I showed you with the Andromeda galaxy, um, they lose that structure and they, and they get, uh, and as they get older, uh, there's less, um, uh, nebulas in them. And then they'll kind of just lose that shape and they'll kind of just turn into big sort of clumps of stars. Um, so that's how the Milky Way was made. It was a bunch of tiny star clusters that kind of smushed together. Hopefully that answers your question, Silas. That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. Uh, and Leonard also says thank you for uh, answering that question about uh, the Seattle skies. Uh, you're welcome, Leonard. All right, so uh, continuing on with the news. Ooh, here's a story that actually just happened today. Um, so uh, I was going to say it was planned, uh, planned to happen today yesterday, but it happened today. So uh, the uh, Russian space agency launched uh, a rocket. This is the Russian website, in case you didn't notice. Um, uh, and now they go to the space station all the time, uh, and we pitched rides for the Soyuz rocket as well. But this mission is unique because uh, they sent a uh, a Russian film crew uh, to the International Space Station. So they actually sent an actress uh, to the International Space Station, and they just got there. Uh, and they are going to be filming about 40 minutes of footage over the next 12 days for a movie that uh, will uh, have to do with space, apparently. So uh, th this uh, this actress um, is going to be preparing uh, a s operating surgeon who has one month pr to prepare for a flight to the International Space Station where she will attempt to save an alien, cos alien cosmonaut's life. Uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, I think, the first official, um, not Hollywood, obviously, but, you know, uh, the big, big budget movie, I guess you could say, being filmed in space. Uh, the movies that... Uh, have been set in space, like say Apollo 13, have not actually filmed in space. They filmed aboard uh, airplanes where they're able to dip down and kind of simulate weight weightlessness. But this is historic in that it's the first uh, mission that uh, is actually, or first movie that's actually gonna be filmed in, in space for real. So we'll be tracking that and maybe I'll provide an update if they release any footage uh, next month when we tune in for our November uh, star uh, live stream. All right, so continuing on with the news, let's see what I want to talk about. I'll give you a little good news here. Um, I was going to save this for last, but we'll just bring it up now. Why not? Uh, so a good news, everyone, because the James Webb Space Telescope is officially on target uh, for its set, uh, current set launch date of December 18th, 2021. That's this year. That is in just a couple months. The James Webb Space Telescope is finally going to launch um and this uh date knock on wood fingers crossed should hold true um there were some issues with the rocket uh that is going to take um uh, the space telescope to the, its uh, resting place at the lagrange point number two um but those issues have been resolved and uh the telescope is all wrapped up and ready to go to space so December 18th uh stay tuned we're definitely going to track that amazing uh, mission. We've been waiting literally decades for this space telescope to go to space. This telescope, um, for those of you who don't know, is uh, an order of magnitude bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope, and it's going to reveal uh, our universe like we've never seen it before, going back in time billions of years to the beginning of our uh, universe. So it should reveal some pretty amazing science. All right, we've just got a couple more stories about our solar system. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up here in the next five or so minutes. So if you have any last minute questions or comments, put those in the comment section now because we're going to be uh, ending our stream relatively soon. Uh, let's do some quick bit stories here. Uh, NASA has announced uh, a landing site for its Artemis rover. Um, this uh, rover is called the Volatiles Investigating Polar Ex Exploration Rover, or VIPER for short. NASA sure loves their acronyms. Um, and it's going to be exploring an ancient crater located near the moon's south pole. Um, well, let's pause here so we don't get copyright strike. Um, so, uh, so this is the landing spot here, and it's going to be exploring a, a very dark crater. Um, so a, a craters at the moon's south pole are so deep and so dark uh, that some have actually been in darkness for billions of years, and there's probably frozen water ice in those craters. And so uh, the uh, Viper mission is going to be exploring these dark craters um, 
It's uh, going to be uh, providing lunar scientists around the world with further insight into our moon's cosmic origin, evolution, and history, and it'll also help inform future Artemis missions to the moon and beyond by enabling us to better understand the lunar environment in these previously unexplored areas hundreds of thousands of miles away, said Associate Administrator uh, for Science at NASA. Um, so the, uh, the Artemis program is our return to the moon. Eventually, it will, we will take uh, human astronauts uh, to the moon. But in the meantime, we're planning a rover to go to the moon. This uh, uh, rover is scheduled for November 2023, so just a couple of years away. Uh, so stay tuned for that exciting mission. Let's move out into our solar system uh, with a space update from Mercury. Hello, Mercury. Uh, the joint Europe and Japan space mission uh, called uh, Bepi Colombo uh, just captured its first flyby photo of Mercury. So uh, this is a double uh, orbiter that um, got uh, sent to or got, got launched in 2018 and has just reached uh, the planet Mercury. Only two other probes have ever traveled to uh, Mercury, the Mariner 10 probe, which flew by in 19, or 1974 and 75, and the Messenger orbiter, which explored Mercury from 2011 to 2015. Um, so the next fly flyby of this uh, orbiter is going to take place in June uh, uh, 2023, uh, as well as other flybys in September 2024, December 2024, and January 2025. Every time it's going to be uh, getting closer and closer, and it will eventually settle into an orbit, staying at Mercury uh, by the end of 2025. Uh, and then these two orbiters will begin their main scientific mission, which will be mapping the surface of Mercury to study its surface processes, composition, and magnetic field. So congratulations to these uh, mission crews uh, for getting their first photo of their final destination, and that mission will be continuing over the next few years. All right, uh, let's move on to the red planet Mars. Uh, NASA has released a couple of really cool tools, uh, which we'll uh, try to uh, post links to. Um, for example, it's released... Uh, it's released... Um, a cool mapping tool that shows you the location of the Perseverance rover uh, on Mars and its uh, travel uh, distance and area. Uh, and you can click on uh, different spots here, different waypoints uh, to learn more about its different days. It, these, are this, uh, these are the Mars days, we call them souls, that it's been on Mars. And you can see the location of Perseverance as well as Ingenuity, it's a little helicopter there. Um, so uh, you can... Uh, look at uh, all the helicopter flights as well. Um, so a pretty cool mapping tool. Uh, there's also a, a, a companion mapping tool for uh, Curiosity, uh, the rover that's been on Mars for a lot longer. And you can see Curiosity has traveled quite a distance there. Um, and it's uh, on its way up Mount Sharp. Um, so it is uh, gonna try to get to the top of Mount Sharp in the Gale Crater there. So you made it quite a distance. Uh, but the other cool tool uh, is uh, even cooler, I think. And this is a awesome 3D viewer of the Perseverance mission. Um, so again, you'll be able to check out this link. We'll post it. Um, but this lets you explore Jezero Crater, the location of Perseverance, in uh, amazing 3D detail. This is pretty incredible that NASA is just putting this available uh, for free on their website. Um, it has uh, camera views. Uh, of Perseverance. It has a sample targets um, and you can click on things and see close-up pictures of the samples that it's taken. Um, pretty, pretty incredible stuff. So uh, you can, uh, you know, click on different parts of the rover and look at different uh, aspects of it. So uh, pretty amazing. I uh, definitely uh, explore this in more detail on your own time. Um, but uh, pretty fun stuff. So check out that. We'll post a link to it. Um, now, speaking of Perseverance and its uh, companion Ingenuity, that little helicopter, uh, there was a bit of an anomaly on this helicopter. Now, I will say that uh, Ingenuity's mission has been totally successful. It was only meant to fly about four or five times as a proof of concept, but it was so successful that it's flown about a dozen more times, and it's actually been serving as a tool for Perseverance, mapping out uh, its uh, future path as it starts to move over the Martian surface. Um, but there was an anomaly as... Uh, NASA uh, engineers detected some uh, some slight changes in some of the motors on Ingenuity, and the reason uh, for these uh, uh, the, the scientists think that the reason for this anomaly is because, well, frankly, Ingenuity has just been doing too well. It's doing so well that it's lasted longer than its originally planned mission target, and at this point, um, Mars is actually undergoing a seasonal shift. So Mars is heading towards its winter. 
Uh, and as the planet gets colder, the atmospheric pressure drops on the surface. And this change in atmospheric pressure will change the robotics and flight profile of this uh, helicopter. So this is actually going to provide NASA scientists and engineers with some amazing data as they uh, collect data and learn more about what it's like to fly on another planet. Um, and um, NASA engineers expect uh, the next flight to take place in a couple weeks, October 14th, they're targeting after the solar conjunction uh, ends, which is sort of blocking signals to Mars right now anyway. Um, so uh, the mission will continue for sure, um, but uh, this is just a proof that Ingenuity is doing really well. It's outlasted its original mission, and um, and we're going to learn even more from uh, uh, from this helicopter. All right, uh, so we are going to check out uh, just uh, two more final stories. So last last chance for comments. Uh, this is going to be kind of a weird one, but I couldn't resist putting this in the stream tonight. Um, so uh, NASA scientists have released a study uh, that, here, let's look at the primary source here, uh, that basically they have done some experiments and found that um, that uh, future uh, colonists to Mars may actually use their own bodily fluids, such as their blood, to create concrete uh, to build structures on Mars. Now, this is kind of crazy, but when the first colonists arrive on Mars, they're going to need to build shelters, right, to live in, to do work, to protect themselves from radiation. Uh, but the Red Planet isn't exactly bustling with hardware stores or material suppliers. Now, all, ideally, the colonists will use some uh, of the stuff that's right there on Mars, the surface soil called regolith, uh, rocks, water you can find in the soil. Uh, but all this is really hard to reach, especially that water, uh, and uh, they won't be able to combine these resources uh, without bringing tools. Uh, we could ship a bunch of bricks and building materials to Mars, but um, estimates suggest that it would cost about $2 million to transport a single brick to the Red Planet, so probably not going to do that. Um, but So this provocative new research suggests that if we mix Martian soil with, uh, with um, materials from the human body, such as blood, it actually forms a very durable concrete-like substance. Um, so here's the chemical process suggesting how this will work. Um, I think they have some uh, pictures of uh, them testing out this process as well, um, as well as some actual science, even though this does sound like some crazy mad scientist stuff. Um, now, this idea didn't come from thin air, actually. Uh, ancient Romans actually used animal blood and other animal parts to produce building materials, such as binders and glue. And they, the Romans actually used animal blood to make concrete. Uh, and uh, there were other human body fluids that these scientists in this study actually found uh, to create even stronger materials. Uh, they used uh, blood combined with uh, urine to pr produce uh, a concrete that was 300 times or 300 percent more strong than just with regular blood. So um, it might it sounds crazy and like some mad scientist stuff, but perhaps someday when we travel to the Red Planet, we'll actually use our own bodies to form materials. And they did the math actually, and. According to this paper, at least, a two-year mission involving six colonists would allow for the production of about uh, 1,100 uh, pounds of high-strength, uh, what they call astro astrocrete, uh, blood-made concrete. Uh, and uh, if each uh, crew member chipped in their blood and urine, the colony would have enough materials to double the available housing over a two-year visit on Mars, setting the stage for future newcomers. So it's not as crazy as it seems. This math and science uh, proves to be correct. And our final story uh, is a bit of a mystery story. So uh, amateur astronomers around the world uh, spotted uh, a, an anomaly on Jupiter. Uh, so let's check this out. So here's video of an, that an amateur astronomer took of Jupiter. And uh, they actually witnessed uh, on September 13th something crashing in to the gas giant planet. Uh, so this giant object slammed into Jupiter and caused... Uh, an explosion in the clouds that we can actually see through amateur telescopes. Uh, and this was seen around the world. Uh, and uh, this, uh, we don't know anything about this space debris, what fell into it, but it was observed. And this type of thing probably happens all the time, actually. Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system, and its gravity is so great that it captures many objects flying by it. Uh, we uh, actually probably owe our very existence to Jupiter. It's so massive that it has captured many large objects that have been passing through our solar system, objects that could have been dangerous to the to life on Earth. So we owe our Jupiter our thanks, and this is evidence that Jupiter protects us. We can see it actually capturing and grabbing some object flying by. Now this has happened before um, in 1994. The comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 
uh, crashed into Jupiter and it left scars on the gas giant planet for weeks afterwards. Um, we actually saw the comet breaking up uh, the year prior and we could actually track it and see it crashing into Jupiter over the course of a few weeks. Um, so that was pretty incredible. And so this is not the first time we've seen something crashing into Jupiter. So uh, everybody uh, give thanks to Jupiter next time you see it in our night sky, which you know how to find it now, thanks to our star tour. Uh, thank you, Jupiter, for uh, protecting us and being the solar system's Roomba, vacuuming up all that debris out in space. All right, everybody. Well, that does it for all of my news stories for today. We're right around the one hour mark, so this is perfect timing. I don't see any other comments or questions, so we're going to go and wrap things up. Thank you all so much for watching our live stream tonight. <clears throat> Thanks for sticking with us, anybody who's still watching. I've been your planetarium manager, Patrick Hess. Um, I'd like to thank our supporting sponsor, MRI Global, as well, for the supporting these streams, as well as other programs at Union Station. Don't forget, Union Station and the planetarium are open to the public. Uh, we are reopened with our brand new HDR projectors, three times as bright as our old ones. So our star tours and fan favorite programs are all back. Check those out and come visit us. We're open six days a week, uh, Tuesday through Sunday. Um, so come see our star tour uh, and uh, come visit Union Station. We're already setting up our holiday decorations, by the way. Uh, the Christmas tree is going up, so it should be a lovely holiday season this year. I hope to see you under our night sky at the planetarium. Otherwise, I'll see you uh, next month during our November uh, What's Up live stream. Right now, we're planning that for November 1st, that first Monday of the month. Uh, and uh, thank you all so much for watching. A couple last minute uh, people commenting. Uh, Kelly says, thanks so much. It was wonderful. Thanks for watching, Kelly. Silas says, will you be, be doing more of these soon? As I just said, Silas, I sure will. We're going to be streaming the first Monday of the month. And if you I want to watch any of our past streams, uh, then go to youtube.com slash KC Planetarium. I have them organized in playlists so you can have a tour of the solar system or check out some uh, sky cultures, different uh, constellations from around the world. Um, so a lot of fun stuff to check out there, Silas. And if you ever have any questions, comment there and I'll answer them as well. Uh, Eric says, great show. Thanks for watching, Eric. And Emily says that, that she has a question. How'd you get to be so smart? Uh, well, Emily, I'm just a, a giant nerd and I love space. And I love telling people about space and I love doing these live streams. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your October and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.